Good afternoon. I am Salah Hassan, Professor of Strategic Brand Management at the George Washington University School of Business. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to George Washington University and welcome you to uh, this MBA class. As a matter of fact, this year, this semester, we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of launching uh, what then was the first MBA graduate course to be taught in the Washington Metro region with a focus on strategic brand management. So, so we have a nice uh, reason to celebrate and thank you for joining us to help us uh, celebrate this occasion and of course celebrate also the launching of your new book. Uh, I am delighted uh, to welcome all of you to uh, this uh, MBA course. Um, this has always attracted a multidisciplinary uh, students uh, from different fields throughout the years. And uh, this year is no exception. Uh, we have, uh, in addition to our MBAs and also students from our specialized master degree programs, we have uh, students from the Elliott School for International Affairs. Uh, we have a student from the uh, law school and from the School of Media Studies and uh, Public Affairs. Um, you see, branding is multifaceted. Uh, it's really a very complex phenomenon, no? and it really requires an interdisciplinary way uh, of looking at it. And uh, what a better way to do that, uh, having a multidisciplinary uh, team of uh, graduate students. Branding has changed. And the world we live in has changed since we inaugurated that course 10 years ago. Well, 10 years ago, Google and Facebook were, were, were considered newly born companies. 10 years later, now we live with the role of Facebook and Google. Google and Facebook, only two companies, and really made their uh, top 10 lists in branding uh, according to uh, recent uh, Business Week uh, Top 100. Uh, so it's ironic how the world have changed and how these two brands have really changed the world of business, not only the world of business that truly have changed the world that we live in, and I don't think I'm exaggerating by saying that. We live in a totally different world uh, that we experienced 10 years ago. Well, uh, we have communication is really uh, cluttered, uh, communication channels, messages, social media. Uh, so how to cut across that clutter effectively through your brand, building strong brands? It represents a major uh, challenge today for us as we live in the digital world. Uh, as a result of that, we have uh, raised a number of questions and have been always asked over the years, why do we need another course on brand strategy if we have courses on uh, management strategy, corporate strategy, marketing strategy? And I say, you see, brand strategy is the connector, is the, build, is the bridge builder huh, between your corporate strategy and your marketing strategy. Yeah? It is the connector between your marketing even strategy and marketing communication programs. The business world we live in today is really all about branding today. Branding is the inward. It's a very important uh, issue that companies are facing today in how to address the branding challenge. For example, the emergence of the millennial uh, consumers. How do we appeal our brands? And by the way, it's a huge missing opportunity for a lot of brands. Big brands have not targeting the millennials specifically yet. So, uh, so what is it that it takes to appeal to the millennial consumers? How are they different? No? What's unique about them? No? And what is the brand value proposition that will be most appealing to them, for example, are some of the questions that we are going to attempt uh, to answer uh, today. Yeah? What is going on today in terms of what are the new brands uh, as it relates to 
the entrepreneur projects. Uh, and a lot of entrepreneur initiatives uh, have high failure rates. And I always say they have very high failure rates because there is a big void, a big gap in terms of understanding <coughs> branding as it relates to entrepreneur uh, products, brands, innovations, initiatives, enterprises. Not much uh, branding work have, done, have been done as it relates to small businesses and entrepreneur uh, initiatives. The not-for-profit world also, well, uh, as how branding appeals to the not-for-profit uh, for world. We see a lot of surge in uh, branding uh, literature as it relates to nation branding and government branding and uh, uh, role of branding in the public sector. All untapped uh, opportunities and uh, only because of the challenges that we are facing today in an over-communicated marketplace cluttered with multi-channels and messages and media and how can we cut across that clutter with an effective yet uh, responsive uh, marketing strategy. Yeah? Um, we are going to cover some issues that relate to how to build strong brands and how to manage brand equity, yeah? how to appeal to the emotions in terms of building uh, emotional equity for uh, the brand as well as uh, again uh, thinking specifically in terms of the functionality of the brand as well. Huh? So how can we bring the brand that is broad enough that appeals to the emotions of uh, the audience, uh, but specific enough that is responsive effectively to, uh, again, the wants, needs, and expectations uh, of that. So with all of that, uh, it gives me a great pleasure uh, to introduce our speaker because of all that momentum. Uh, we uh, found uh, Star Brands is truly uh, an innovative book that is advancing uh, a robust uh, approach uh, and a very pragmatic approach uh, with respect to brand management and brand strategy. And uh, I'm very fortunate to have uh, with us our guest speaker uh, today here, uh, uh, a, brand, a star brand builder in her own right, an educator, an author. Carolina Rogels uh, has uh, been a brand builder of some of the world's most admired brands, um, a director uh, with the, a world global leader in consumer batch goods, uh, Procter & Gamble. Uh, there is no, it's a school of thought in its own way. It's a best practice in its own way. It's, a, it's, a, it's really a trendsetter and a leader in its own way when it comes to branding, brand strategy, and, and marketing uh, best practices. Uh, we teach P&G, and as a matter of fact, uh, the opening class session, I did show them without knowing that we are going to attract you over we were showing a tremendous video and uh, uh, the history of PNG and how uh, the branding portfolio have evolved. Uh, if it was a nation, it would have been one of the top nations uh, of the world today. So Carolina, thank you for joining us. Uh, Carolina has worked across uh, different products and categories and global uh, marketing uh, in initiatives. Uh, she also uh, a faculty member uh, of uh, the first graduate uh, degree program in branding, a master degree program in branding. Uh, so she teaches uh, uh, in that uh, uh, program and her book, Star Brands, uh, just uh, been launched and we are uh, uh, very proud to adopt it as one of uh, our reading uh, materials uh, uh, for the uh, supplemental reading materials for the course. Uh, so uh, allow me to welcome uh, Carolina Rogels. Thank you so much for coming to uh, customize a special program and a work, uh, workshop session in the, in the afternoon as well. Thank you so much for, uh, please join me in uh, welcoming Carolina. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Professor, for that warm welcome. I'm very excited to be with you tonight. It's my first time at the George Washington University, so I've been looking forward to this event for a while. And congratulations on this program. Thank Ten you. years is quite an accomplishment, so I'm glad I get to be part of it today Thank for a couple of hours. So today, as you heard from Professor Hassan, we're going to be talking about star brains. 
And uh, this is the concept of the book, but we will talk about why it matters, what you can learn about it, and how you can apply it. Tell me your name and your favorite brand. This is the first question I ask my students when I begin class at the Masters in Branding. And the reason why I do this is because I not only want to meet them, but I also want to understand what the brand is that is top of mind at that very moment. <coughs> one by one, students begin raising their hands. They introduce themselves. Some very excited about their favorite brand. Some can decide between their favorite brand. I'm sure this is going through your head as we speak, but I'm not going to ask you yet. We'll do that later. And I've been teaching this class for several years now, and I'm always amazed at the consistency of brands that show up. Brands like Starbucks, brands like Google. Other brands make repairing, repairing appearances from our students. And yes, there's the local brand at the moment, the local fashion brand at the moment, but there are brands that make recurring appearances because they're doing something right. And these are the brands that I call star brands. These are the brands that are celebrities of the branding world. These are the <coughs> leading lights that you look up to if you're a marketer. So the concept of star brands is brands that have been able to accomplish that love that someone is willing to raise their hand to associate themselves with. And these brands are not only recognizable, are not only loved by the people that like to associate themselves with them, they're also profitable. But the thing about these brands is that they aren't born, they're actually made. These brands are a result of effort over time. Careful strategy, thoughtful execution, year over year. These are the brands that are a result of the right strategy, the right execution, and the right marketing strategies that enable you to create that love among consumers. And you will be surprised to find that even despite these being star brands and getting a lot of things right, According to the Havas Media Group, they survey a lot of consumers around the world and they ask them, which brands are really making a meaningful difference in your life? And it turns out that only 20% of brands around the world, according to consumers, are making a difference in consumers' lives. That's one in five. That's not a lot. Imagine the amount of dollars in marketing and brand building that is spent around the world. So, only a few make a difference, and to get that right, there's a science for that. And we're going to be talking about what these brands get right. Now, why would star brands be important? Not because this is just a marketing course, or not because this is what I do for a living, or what you're learning to um, practice in your professional lives. It's because we are today in an entrepreneurial economy. Every month, there's over 500 million new businesses started in the US every month. And half of these businesses will fail. But half of these businesses have a chance to succeed. And those are the businesses I like to focus on because they have the potential to become star brands. How many of you have ever considered having your own business? A few, right? How many of you have worked on a project on how to build a stronger brand. Okay. How many of you would like to own a brand? All right. So if I add all of you guys up, <laughs> we cover basically all the future brand builders. Many of you could be the brand builders of the future because we are in an entrepreneurial economy. So anyone really benefits from knowing these concepts. <coughs> I've been fascinated with brands since a very early age. I started my first business when I was seven years old. And granted, I was just going after a very appealing target at the time, which is my neighbors with extra cash, trying to get, you know, sell them stuff for the holidays. And I did pretty well. I, what I made uh, surpassed my allowance. For, you know, at that time, that's pretty good. But I was just making transactions. 
you know, I was making money, but I was really not doing, I was not building brands. I was not making a difference. And so I went through high school with several businesses. I counted them last time. I had probably 20 different attempts. And then I said, I was better off probably studying in how to build brands. And so I did. So here you see the different you know, universities that I've attended to. I uh, had the luxury to start at Procter & Gamble right after school, uh, the mecca of <laughs> brand building, and then grow building brands and touching several of uh, these amazing brands that make a meaningful difference in consumer lives today. And to the point that after managing billion dollar brands, I got this passion for also teaching others how they can do that themselves because everyone benefits from doing that today. So now I'm here able to share with you all the knowledge that I have gathered throughout the years building brands but also <coughs> studying how these brands are built. So the intent of this chat today is to <coughs> equip you with the principles that I've discovered are critical in building brands stemming from what star brands do best, and also how you can do that on your own. So, this is what we're gonna do. First, we're going to learn the six principles about the star brands, what they do best, and why that matters. And then we're going to go over the star brands framework, which is my personal take on an ideal brand building process that anyone can follow for any brand at any stage of their development. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Right? All right. <laughs> Let's start. The first concept and principles of star brands is clarity. And when I speak about this concept, I really talk about know thyself. And know thyself, remember, is the ancient Greek maxim that talks about the self-awareness of the individual. That applies to brands as well. As a brand, you need to be very clear about what you stand for, what, you, what has driven success for you in the past, what you need to do in the future, stemming from what has worked for you in the past, your strengths and weaknesses, who you need to delight, what are the consumers that you're going after. If you're not clear what your role is in the marketplace and the role that you can play in a consumer's life, you're gonna be lost in the brand building journey. So clarity is principle number one, and star brands deliver on that. The second concept is consistency. Star brands are consistently executed. How they look, how they feel, how they sound, regardless of the touch point, is consistent. So every time you're exposed to the brand, the consumer is recognizing the cues of what the clarity should have given you at the first place. Now, consistency looks great on PowerPoint. It's really hard to execute because you have a lot of people touching the brand and making advertising possible, making the product possible. But the good news is that the discipline that comes from consistency pays out because it's been proven that every time you expose the consumer to a consistent cue, you're gonna be driving the awareness of the brand in the way that's going to drive your sales. So consistency and that discipline that is required to drive consistency pays out. And Coca-Cola, as you can tell here, is one of the brands that does that best. Concept <coughs> number three is higher order purpose. Star brands aspire to deliver on a higher order purpose beyond the product and service that they sell. They're intentional about this. There was research done by Jim Stengel and the Millward um, group that, th that showed that the 50 brands that were growing the fastest from the 2000 to 2010 were those brands that were leading with an ideal. So, Having an ideal for your brand and leading as such is not only a great sign of character, it's also a business building activity. So the brands that are really trying to connect with consumers today and that do it best 
they connect from an ideal. Because we know that consumers, when given the opportunity, will select the brands that share the same ideals that they have. That's the importance of having a high order purpose for your brand. Concept number four is emotional connections. Just like I shared when I was being very transactional when I had my businesses, I was not really building relationships. There was nothing to latch on to. Star brands, instead of transactions, build relationships with their consumers. How do they do this? Is by that deep understanding of who their consumer is, how to reward them, and how to use the product and the communication that you have in the marketplace in order to strengthen that relationship. I love this picture. Imagine the brand devotion that Harley is able to create that consumers willingly <coughs> tattoo their brand on themselves. That is true consumer devotion. That is something to aspire to in terms of building emotional connection as a brand. Concept number five, superior benefits. Remember, benefits, which is what a brand offers, is what sets it apart versus competition. So if you're in the game of setting yourself apart from competition, you need to have superior benefits. You need to be focused on what is that thing that I'm going to uniquely do, give you, consumer, so that you reward me with your purchase, with your relationship. And star brands excel at consistently delivering, nurturing, and communicating what sets them apart. What is that they do best than anyone else? And finally, this is a critical behavior of any star brand, is what I call commitment to learning. Star brands behave like learning organizations. What this means is that they have a vision of the future and they have a disciplined approach about documenting their learnings, what works, what doesn't, so that they don't repeat the same mistake. If we think about the concept of evolution from Darwin, it also applies to star brands. It's not the survival of the smartest or the fittest. It's those that are most adaptable to change. And that is very true about the brands for today. Those that don't adapt disappear. Star brands know how to adapt, and they do that really well. These are the six core principles of star brands. If you think about them, these are <laughs> concepts that you can really aspire to from a brand building perspective. They give you a north. They give you an example on what you can emulate. But that's just step one knowing what they do, what makes them great. The question is, how can, you do the, can, how can you do that yourself? And that is where the star brand model comes in. And as I mentioned before, this is a model that I developed based on my own research, my experience, and what I've seen work best. It's a model because it's supposed to work as a framework. We all know that we increase our chances of success when we follow a guide when we know which steps to follow. Because we're looking to recreate an experience that someone else has been through. So that's the intent of following a model when building brands. So we're gonna go through it. It has five steps, not because that's the shape of the star. There's actually five steps. So it just uh, brings the concept to life. And these steps are really intended to capture a process of strategy, discovery, creativity, and action, which is what we repeatedly do during the brand building process. So we're gonna go through one by one, and then I'm gonna give you practical examples how you can start doing this today for either your branding project, those of you that have your secret passion of building your own brand, or even to yourselves, because all of these concepts work for yourself as well because you are a brand as well, whether you know it or not. You're setting yourself apart in the marketplace when you wanna find a job or if you're starting your own business. So this is applicable to you as well, you are as a brand. Okay, we're gonna get started. 
the first step in any brand building effort is understanding where you're starting from. Because if you don't know where you stand today, you cannot really chart your territory, nor your trajectory. You're gonna be running around in circles if you don't know where you're starting from. So step number one in any brand building effort is really recognizing where you're coming from, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, your opportunities, and your threats. And I know several of you have already applied the concept of the SWAT, and you do this <laughs> very well. But when you apply it to a brand, the key to do it well is that you have to first raise your hand and say, what market am I going to compete in? And then you assess what is the opportunity that your brand has within that marketplace. Let's take luxury cards, for example. If you're a luxury card, a bike might not be in your competitive set, right? So you would do a SWOT analysis for your brand with that specific concept. But if you're a small urban car, the bike might be in your competitive set. So how you go about defining the sphere of influence and your chances of success as a brand is really determined by the competitive set and what you're starting to think about are the areas of opportunity for yourself in terms of building your brand and attracting more consumers. So we're gonna talk about this, which is you need to be very, very clear right at the beginning <coughs> what strengths you have as a brand, what are the weaknesses, what are you bringing with you in that brand building journey, and what are the opportunity and threats that you're going to capitalize on and also actively manage, okay? Now, we have a SWOT, great. What does that really mean? We're doing all of this to really chart the trajectory of growth that we want as a brand. If you're starting a brand, you're starting a business, you wanna make money, you wanna succeed, you wanna last over time. But the reality is that the journey not, for not all brands is very linear. You're gonna go up and down and move in that funnel several times. So this example here, it's, it's more basically of that circular process of there will be times after the startup phase where you're going to be sustaining your success. Other <coughs> times you will lose your way as you try new things. You need to realign. You could be in a situation where you need to turn around everything that you thought was working will not work because <coughs> the market is not stable. And there are times where the best thing to do is to divest the brand or just not continue the brand anymore if it's not creating value. So after you have done the SWOT, you need to really understand what is the trajectory that your brand is currently in and from which stage you want to get out of. Because the level of strategy and dollar investment and marketing efforts will vary based on the growth strategy that you pick, but also based on where you're starting from. A marketing plan and a strategy from a turnaround case looks very different than when you're in a realignment phase and vice versa. So it's important to determine your strategy. Okay. So we have step one. We said it's about knowing where you are and this links back to the concept of clarity. You need to know where you're coming from before you get started. The second step in the model is really defining your brand equity and your target. And this is where the money is. This is where you're going to say, this is how I'm going to be creating value for myself and the consumers that I interact with. It's basically your positioning. How are you going to create value in the marketplace? And then who are the consumers to whom that positioning is most appealing to? Because without consumers, there's no brand. That would be just a logo. Let's do a little quiz here. The bottled water market in the US. How many brands do you think there are in the US of bottled water? Amy, Alyssa, uh, any? Probably like over a thousand I'd take a lot more than that. Very good. Yeah, that's a very good shot. Actually, there are 700 registered bottled water brands in the US. 
That's a lot <laughs> of water. <laughs> In theory, they all solve the same basic need of thirst. But the reality is that the explosion of the water market in the U.S. has less to do with thirst and more with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Because it's thanks to Maslow's hierarchy of needs that tells us that there are different needs that consumers have from the physiological to self-actualization that could apply to any industry, to any product, that multiple brands can choose to go after solving these needs in any category. So yes, is there a need for a $60 bottle of water? Maybe not, but according to this, there is. And according to this, is that brands are possible. So Maslow is something that you will see me reference a lot in the book because it's just very simple psychology theory that applies to all of us in this room. This is how we operate, our brains operate but that's what makes branding possible because you tap into the consumer needs and how is it that you can serve in, service each need in a unique way. So Maslow helps us think about how do you create a <coughs> positioning for a brand. What is that need in that specific category <coughs> that I can create value by creating a differentiated positioning? So that is where the concept of equity pyramid, which is the most used depiction of how a brand creates value. Some people also call it the brand DNA. Um, in terms of articulating what are the different components that build a brand, which is the system of how you communicate with consumers and you create value in the marketplace. This is how it looks. Similar to Maslow's pyramid, you have a foundation in the bottom, which is the ownable assets, which is what consumers visually can recognize and ident identify you with in the marketplace. Those are the things that really, if you were to sell the brand or someone were to copy them, you would really lose a lot of market value because those are the things that you have been investing eyeballs or will decide to invest to getting eyeballs on to register what your brand stands for. Unique benefits, recall from the principle of superior benefit, is what the brand really offers. This is basically what the consumer is getting in exchange for buying your product or service. Brand promise is the whole package. What are you offering in terms of the experience, in terms of the product and the service? Because I don't think we're longer in the world where people just buy product. People buy into a promise that you're giving me something in exchange for the money that I have or the time that I have. And then ultimately, the pyramid goes all to support the brand ideal, which we've talked about for star brands, having a higher order ideal is what they typically focus on just beyond delivering <coughs> an outstanding product or service but how they really want to find meaning and communicate with consumers. So if you think of the top of a pyramid is where we start to talk about the concept of why. Why does the brand exist? What is the role of the brand in the marketplace? Which brand is this? <coughs> okay. Any other guesses? Someone believes this is not Harley Davidson? It's Harley Davidson. Yeah. It's one of the most iconic American brands. And the reason why I love using this brand is we saw it earlier in the emotional connection is they have been able to establish over 100 years emotional connections with a very particular group of consumers which continues to expand with not bikes, with experiences. I would argue no one buys a Harley just to meet their transportation needs. <laughs> it's to meet other needs. So how would the equity for Harley look like? Let's take a look. Starting from the bottom, we would start to think about the ownable assets, right? So we know we recognize the logo of the Harley brand. Uh, if I would have played the sound, you probably would have recognized and you said that's distinctly Harley. The bike design, as we could tell from the picture, and 
the hardly owner groups is something while in a ownable assets you typically wouldn't put any of the marketing activity for Harley the rallies and the group of uh, of Harley owners has really become a very distinct um, symbol of what the brand is all about all around the world and this has been core to their expansion strategy globally so that is why it belongs there then you have the unique benefits. These are the things that over years have continued to secure brand, uh, consumers buying the brand because they have what they call the V-twin engine that sets them apart versus other brands. The level of cra craftsmanship, which is quite high, and they pride themselves on that. And you see that throughout their executions. And of course, their heritage, because it's a brand especially very much connected to the American culture. The brand promise in this case, it would be authentic American motorcycle experience. It's an experience and you qualify it with all the elements that come behind it. But finally, what the reason why Harley is in business is to fulfill dreams of personal freedom. If you think about their advertising, if you think about what Harley can do in your life, it's more about reaching that higher top of the pyramid of self-actualization through the product. So this is an example on how you can, and we're gonna do this exercise later in the workshop, is if you're defining a brand, what would go into each bucket that one by one would support each other? And this is how you decide to communicate and create a brand in the marketplace. So this is super important step, so that's step number two. Of course, once you know what you stand for, consumers are just not gonna come to you directly. You need to identify who are those consumers to whom that equity is most relevant to. And this is where the concept, <coughs> you can also use Maslow to say, what are the needs that consumers have in this specific category that I can uniquely solve? So, for example, and you saw this probably in the book, if we're talking about genes, what are the different reasons why consumers might buy a pair of jeans? It's not the same. If I were to survey each of you, you might give me a different answer. So understanding even taking apart any category by the different needs that consumers might have will allow you to really find who are the consumer that you want to target. The importance of this, that you start with needs, is because there's this tendency to segment consumers by demographics. 18 to 45, you know, make $50,000 to $75,000. And that is really misleading because your income or where you live is not necessarily driving <coughs> distinctive needs for a specific category. Because for certain categories, you might spend more money than others based on your personal interests. So you should be thinking about segmenting your market based on the needs or behaviors to your specific category, not necessarily the demographic, because people are not the bracket that they fall in according to a quantitative study. The needs of the category where you compete in. So Maslow can help you for that as well. And once you have the equity, you understand which is the need and how big is the group that I can go after. Once you have identified the segment to go after based on that equity fit and how attractive that market is, then it's your job to meet that consumer and understand what makes them tick. I recently wrote an article for entrepreneur.com which was nine creative ways and how to meet your target. You don't need large budgets to go and meet the consumer. You just need to have the intention to figure out how is it that you can meet your target consumer, get creative, have a conversation with them face to face, give them an incentive so that you can talk to them freely and understand how is it that you can get more of those consumers. This is one of the core responsibilities of any <coughs> brand manager, not only identifying the target that you're going after, but also meeting them and having such a good understanding of the consumer that you can easily create a persona that embodies what that consumer looks like 
makes them tick, how they consume your product, because this is the information that is going to be important to make travel for everyone who's touching the brand and is creating a relationship with your consumers day to day. So we talked about where you stand. We talked about what you stand for and who you need to go after. Now step three is about defining what you're going to tell them. So up to this point, we have been just work, been working on paper. Now we just need to determine is what is the communication that will really entice consumer, persuade them to get into the product, to talk to us. And the step to start there is to really understand what is the benefit. Remember, that comes from the equity pyramid. What is the one thing that you are going to be great at? But if all I did was to tell you Red Bull helps you push the boundaries every day, that's not going to get me far. I need an insight of the consumer's life to connect in order for them to pay attention to what I have to tell them. So ideas are built once you have the perfect marriage from a benefit that comes from your equity pyramid and an insight that's coming from your target. The insight is what gives you the permission to connect with them because it tells you, you get me, you know me. If you don't have the connection in advertising, and I wish we had like the whole two hours to just talk ad advertising, is your benefit will not be persuasive enough for the consumer because you have to set it up in a way that is meaningful, in a way that opens the consumer's hearts and mind what you have to offer. So ideas are created by the combination of these two things. If you have an advertising agency, these are the components that would go in an advertising brief. If you're doing it on your own, you just have to find it yourself by talking to the consumer and identifying what the benefit. And all the greatest campaigns in the world will follow the same principle and you can see this clearly. Who remembers the priceless campaign from MasterCard, right? It's one of the longest standing campaigns in history. They've been running the campaign for 30 years. Let me tell you, that's very, very difficult to achieve. Almost impossible. The idea of priceless moments comes from the MasterCard team really understanding that for their consumer, it was not that the things that they bought that mattered, was the relationship of the moments that they were spending with those that they care most about. And the benefit of the brand connected just because their benefit is about enabling you to have a simpler life. But it was the perfect connection of a benefit that might come from the equity pyramid, enables you to focus on what matters. But until you connected with the consumer insight of, it's not what you buy, is the people and the relationship, you won't be able to get to an idea like priceless moments. So that's where all these things come together and that's how really great advertising comes to life. And it's not more complicated than that. Than that. Simple, great briefs that have these components give birth to brilliant ideas. But getting there requires strategy work, consumer understanding. So we have an idea. Now we need to say, we have an idea. I know what I stand for. I know where I'm coming from. I know what my growth strategy is. I'm going to make this work. And that is where we put our business hat on. And we recognize that brands are businesses. And our role in marketing and our role in brand building is to find the perfect mix of the marketing elements, like promotion, placement, positioning, the traditional four piece of marketing, and the exact right equation to deliver more sales. And the reason why that's important is because is the combination of those elements that directly impact your ability to sell more or less of your product or service every year. Very simple formula here, which I call the brand math. In order for sales to exist, first, consumers need to be aware of your product. If no one knows you, no one is going to go and buy you. If you're not appealing, then no one's going to buy you either. Because they might know about you, but if they go to the shelf and 
you really did not deliver on the promise that you made in awareness. For example, advertising would all fall in the uh, awareness bucket, then you're not going to make a sale. And let's say you convince them. They heard about you in advertising. They decide to go and get you because you're appealing. But if the consumer doesn't find you, they cannot buy the product. So distribution has a big role to play in how you build your brand. It's because of that that in consumer product goods, for example, being distributed at Walmart or not, or being delisted, makes or breaks your year. Even without making any changes to your proposition or your awareness, distribution has a very high correlation with brand sales. And finally, usage. This is probably one of the less well-known or less uh, used um, tools and the marketing repertoire is understanding really what is the ideal use of consumers. What are the right quantities? What are the right sizes of the product in order for them to have the best experience? So when we think about pricing, sizing strategy, when we think about quantities, how, what is the right configuration to launch a product or the frequency of the service that you offer is key also to how you drive your sales. So at this point, we need to start wearing our business hat on and say, everything that we said how we're going to create value, how is that really going to happen in market? So this is critical because remember, brands are businesses. And if I don't sell more over time, if I don't reach more consumers over time, the brand will no longer exist. And then finally, step five is about creating the marketing plan and the measurement plan on what you're going to go and do in the marketplace. The reason why this deserves a whole step is because typically it takes discipline and effort to reflect in a document, in one document that everyone agrees to, to go and execute against. They say a goal without a plan is just a wish. And it's true. Building brands requires discipline. And this is what brand managers are hired to do year over year. These five steps that I talked about, this happens every year. This is how you build brands, this is how you destroy brands, or this is how you turn them into star brands. This happens every year. That's the brand building process. And you might not get all the brand choices right, but if you think about it, if you really know what the best brands do, what sets them apart, and you know which steps to follow in order to increase your chances of success, you'll be successful at it. So this is my gift to you for the future brand builders. Follow the process, get vested on understanding the brands, and whether you build your own brand or you treat yourself as a brand, you will really make a difference. So thank you. Great. That's it. Thank you. Very clear and very concise. Uh, thank you so much. And I think at this point in time, we'd like to open the floor for uh, a Q&A. So uh, any questions? And by the way, Carolina, uh, I did share with her <coughs> all your phase one brand audit reports. And she told me she read them in her way in. <laughs> <laughs> So she is very versed in what you have been uh, doing. Yes. Can I have a question yes. about the, the math equation? Yes. About the distribution? Yes. Um, would you say that that's still just as important with online where you could Google and product that so that Walmart and buy it online? Great question. So the question is how important now with the uh, online availability of products is that really to brand building? I would say is now even more critical because the barrier of entry for brands from a distribution perspective is not as high as it used to be. Now, we know that the e-commerce development varies by industry. So I think you simply need to be there and the availability of brands absolutely is impacted by online and also 
the other way in which is impacted is you have more competitors all of a sudden. Because now the luxury of having secure a deal to be distributed at a Walmart or a Target or a Neiman Marcus if you're a luxury brand. You know, anyone opening up a shop in any, <laughs> you know, at their house for any brand can compete with you. So definitely need to consider it. I think the impact to the business itself varies by <coughs> industry. Now we're also seeing the reverse story. For example, brands like Warby Parker that made their their big businesses online and because that's their business model, what are they doing? They're opening brick and mortar stores because they're also finding that there's a benefit of the foot traffic of the consumer experiencing the brand. So I just, I would like to say there's more of the uh, blurring of where the transactions really take place. So any brand needs to learn how to master both the online and the offline world. So very interesting, a lot changing, of course. So a very good question. Yes. So I have a question about um, personas. Personas take it's, it's like I mean it takes a long time to develop a really good persona, and you have to get to know your core user very well. So I was wondering if you have some examples in your own journey of how you've developed personas and how you, how you use them effectively. Very good question, and you're absolutely right. It takes a while to really capture the persona. Um, and I would say two words of advice. The document itself and the persona might not represent everyone who's going to buy your brand. The intent of the persona is to represent the most valuable insights and the most valuable aspirations that the segment might have so that in advertising, for example, you showcase them. But the persona might not necessarily be, be ultimately everyone who buys your brand. Now, not everyone will fit there. But the true work is understanding for that specific need or that behavior that I believe can serve as the consumer best, who are they? Now, on your question is what to do. I think nothing beats talking with the consumer and observation. So the best experiences I've had is, for example, when with spend a whole day with a consumer, not being in focus group. So for example, if you are working on food, you should be spending the day with a consumer understanding how she cooks, what she makes <coughs> for breakfast. So I'm a big, big believer, I call it uh, ethnographies, to really understand what the consumers are doing. Because we really know that claim data only goes that thus far in terms of telling you what X percentage of consumers do in general, but until you see it, you will not have the riches of the insight. Because consumers, a lot of the behavior from consumers is not conscious. You know, we buy brands based on the stimulus that we're giving. So I would say prioritize anything that is where you can observe directly the consumer, when you can talk directly, directly to the consumer. And then when you have the persona, really important to really articulate what are the tensions in their life that you're trying to solve. What is it? We, I really believe that those rich stories or the consumer reviews, those lovers and haters that you get, for example, in your online sales, there's a lot of insight there. So I think it's more about capturing what truly matters. And then once you do that, there are different ways to bring that to life you know, in the large size cardboard of your consumer or a PowerPoint that is circulated, but the content of the ultimate core aspirations and tensions of a group of consumers that your brand solves uh, would be the priority, okay? So a persona, <coughs> a persona is not a market segment. So a persona is an archetype or a prototype of a profile of an aspirational consumer that represents, represents the a target market segment. Yes, yeah. Uh, Brad Anderson, the former mm -hmm. CEO of uh, Best Buy, was uh, really made a mark for Best Buy in uh, developing a persona mm -hmm. uh, profiling and the different archetypes mm -hmm. of different uh, persona profiles that would be uh, coming to the Best Buy store and use that in training of their employees 
and uh, gave rise to the blue shirts and how the uh, electronic business mm -hmm. is not based on selling electronics, but in building relationships based on these personas. Can you think of other examples of other brands that uh, you think that they are best practice in, uh, in personification and the build up of uh, the persona and building the engagement based on that persona? Very good question. There are so many different ways in which you can segment the market, right? I think uh, when I think about um, brands and food, for example, when we think about the McDonald's and Coca-Cola's and Pepsi of the world, they uh, oftentimes look at more of the life, stakes, life stage segmentation, right? For example, how do I appeal to a younger generation? How do I appeal to uh, consumers that might be the based on behavior, the breakfast goers? I don't know if you saw the new campaign from Taco Bell, right? They're trying to just go after the breakfast segment, which is led by a behavior, it might not necessarily be, you know, on the other initiatives that certain brands go after younger consumers, right? Which we've also seen done very well uh, by um, by fast food companies that are trying to desperately get, you know, the younger consumers. So, so I would say a mix of these different um, tactics is what I've seen. The ones that work best <laughs> are either life stages, mm -hmm. right, where you're really trying to go after a specific consumer need. Um, for example, brands like Pampers, mm -hmm. you know, when they know when to target the, the mom, you know, earlier in the phase where the baby is delivered, mm -hmm. you know, then you focus on understanding who are the different types of moms and what are the different needs. Mm -hmm. So I would say there's so many examples and so many brands the key is understanding for your specific brand, how can you create the right segments based on needs or behaviors in order to then orchestrate all your marketing efforts mm -hmm. against them. Because is the focus towards the consumer specifically that really pays out. I think what I've seen not work well, and a lot of brands do, is the, the demographic. Mm -hmm. The demographic because bucketing consumers without no rhyme and reason mm -hmm. uh, on the wrong variables or going very lofty mm -hmm. attitudinal mm -hmm. without <laughs> having much foundation. I mm -hmm. think that's where I've seen uh, some brands mm -hmm. not, um, not really delivering. Mm -hmm. Now, Thank you. also, many brands benefit from sometimes going after just one target, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. versus trying to cater. But if you're a big brand, you need to drive trial among a lot of consumers, and that's where it becomes more complicated. The smaller the brand, the easier it is to focus on one consumer. The larger you go, then you have to be more sophisticated about maybe going after different segments. And that's why I think life stages or um, a specific behaviors for your product is what I've seen work best. Okay. More questions? Yeah, Matthew. Uh, well, going back to personas, I mean, I, I kind of think of Harley Davidson as that persona is, is pretty well defined, <clears throat> but isn't all that, um, it's, it's rather inclusive, is, is rather, um, do, do you, I guess my question is, do you always, how open should your, your this archetypical mm -hmm. person be mm -hmm. for <coughs> the average consumer? Mm -hmm. There's two things. So first of all, when we talk about, maybe I should go back to this slide, and um, there's a little bit of this on uh, chapter six, I believe, so chapter six uh, of the book, which is, first of all, the persona is a consumer. So to your earlier question, you can pick the story of one consumer that embodies best and represents the whole group. Now, the brand character which is if the brand was to be a person is different than the consumer. Because again, brand character, was, which is my brand and hardly, and you would use terms like um, rugged, you know, authentic Americana. If, if the brand was a person, that is more the brand character. The sample persona chart is who are the consumers that are going after. So for example, in the case of Harley, could be, you know, the um, successful 
business owners that have a need to escape on the weekends. And their need there could be either, you know, the freedom of expression, you know, or it could be the ones that join. You could have another segment, which is consumers that need a sense of belonging. And those are the ones that own the uh, Harley owner groups. So even within Harley, you could have segments, but what sets them apart is, do you buy a Harley because you want to satisfy your sense of belonging? Or because you love the freedom of riding and you need the escape? Two different needs. They might look like the same, but belonging and freedom and self-actualization could be <coughs> delivered differently. And then you could see your advertising come to life differently. So that's the difference between those it concepts. could be even different personas. Yeah, they would look different, you know, they would, uh, the advertising would be different and also your marketing tactics might be different, right? Because if I'm going after, let's say, uh, successful business owners, I might advertise in certain magazines, right? But if I'm going after, okay, those that are already in that mindset of the freedom of the road or adventure, you know, instead of putting maybe an ad on Forbes, I will put the ad in, you know, a travel magazine or maybe ones where I already talk more about the French lifestyle. So the persona helps you then decide what is the media landscape, media behavior, and, media behavior and the mindset on when and where the consumer is most receptive to the advertising. And we'll talk that about briefly and as we get to the second part, okay? One more question, because I think after that we can transition yeah, into absolutely. the rest of the content, because we can talk this for the next hour, for sure. Yes? Or you can go ahead, I, I get to see her later on. So <laughs> okay. uh, thank you for the nice presentation. Thank you. And I would like you to explore a little bit about the user, like the building a brand is not straightforward. Sometimes you need to make changes. If you have a, an example on top of your mind. Well, I think all the brands have gone through the ups and downs. For example, one that comes to life uh, in terms of the realignment phase, uh, if I go back, um, Burberry, the fashion brand, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's a brand that in, in theory is very clear, very well defined, with very strong ownable assets. But what was happening, call it 10 years ago, and they had some um, <coughs> management changes is they were no longer relevant to the, not only the catwalk fashion, but also not to younger consumers. Mm -hmm. So their phase was more on the realignment is how do you also keep a brand that is known for their trench coats, for their pattern, for I guess uh, London lifestyle, but was not being relevant you know, for the consumers that are buying Top Shop, you know, or going to the H&Ms of the world. So very interesting how what they decided to do was keep their ownable assets, but they started to bring elements like, you know, bringing uh, celebrities like Kate Moss and even younger um, celebrities like uh, Emma Watson from um, Harry Potter. They're, they're very intentional tactics of bringing relevance for the target that they knew they need to go after. They expanded into fine fragrances and did a lot of things, but that's one I think is best in class where it's very hard to achieve staying core to who you are, but bringing relevance. And that is typically where you would be either in a turnaround or realignment phase, which is you are losing consumers. And this is happening to McDonald's, this is happening to Coke. This is, you have to remember commitment to co learning be to stay relevant, you need to put put the uh, check the pulse of the consumers that are really staying with you, who are the ones that might not be coming but might be relevant, and then figure out a way to do that very well. I think there are a lot of brands um, that go through all these phases all of the time. Every year is an opportunity to reassess because the market is not um, the market changes all the time. So do consumers and consumer preferences. So. Plenty of examples, the key is understanding once you know where you are, how much you need to change in order to sustain success. They could have chosen to abandon the trench coats and the pattern, they would have lost their way, right? So how is it that you stand from your position of strength but then complement to what you need to do next? Okay. Thank you, Carolina, thank you very much, thank you. <laughs> 
thank you so much uh, for uh, your presentation and definitely you brought a lot of things to light uh, for us. On behalf of the uh, students, I uh, really would like uh, to give you a special thank you. I know this is your first visit to uh, George Washington University and I hope this is not going to be the last one. I hope we will uh, engage in a lot of uh, exchanges in the future and we hope to bring you in a future program. Also on behalf of my uh, colleagues at the uh, uh, George Washington University School of Business, I would like to uh, present you with a, a small uh, thank gift. You, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank it transcends yes, time. <laughs> so give me a clue. Thank you. Thank you.